Chapter 17 of Ramayana's Balakanda Towards Gautama's Ashrama Om Shri Ramaya Ramabhadraya Ramachandraya Vedase Raghunathaya Nathaya Sitaya Pataye Namaha Early in the morning, the party of the rishis headed by Vishwamitra, who had the princess by his side, went towards Vishala, a beautiful city. They had crossed the Ganga with the help of a boat and had reached the other bank. Rama was still thinking of the glorious narration of the descent of Ganga. On the northern banks of Ganga, they saw the city by name Vishala. As was natural to him, Rama wanted to know whose city it was and who was ruling it now. Vishwamitra said, The history of this city goes as far back in time as the churning of the ocean of milk when Amrita was found. The Devas and the Asuras weed with each other to be the sole possessors of the bowl containing nectar. Narayana, with his guile, managed to let the Devas have it. There ensured a war and several of the famed Asuras were killed in this war. And so, Diti, the mother of the Daityas, was very unhappy. She asked her husband to help her to be the mother of a son who would be able to kill Indra. Kashyapa taught her the incantations and there was one condition which she had to obey with great care. She had to be very pure and clean and should never make a single mistake regarding this rule. A lapse would mean that her desire would not be granted. Diti listened to it all carefully. She observed all the rules well and Indra was by her side all the time. He was attending to her wants and by and large making himself useful to her. He was her sister's son and on that pretext he was with her. She was extremely careful but one day she was careless and Indra who was waiting for this chance took advantage of it and managed to cut the little child inside her into pieces. Try as he might, he could not destroy the pieces and they began to cry. He had cut the child into seven pieces and all seven began to cry. And all seven of them were crying. Diti was asleep and he did not want her to wake up and so he told the crying children, Do not cry, Ma Rudha. Meanwhile, Diti was awake and found that calamity had overtaken her. Indra said, Mother, you wanted me to be destroyed and as a matter of self-preservation, I had to resort to this. But your children are not dead. See, I could not kill them. So powerful is the effect of your vrta. My vajra was ineffective. There are now seven children instead of one. Forgive me and take your sons. I could not kill them. Diti knew that they were not going to kill Indra since her vrta had been tainted by her laps. She said, No one can conquer fate and it is destined that no evil should befall you. Since you are responsible for these children, partly, you can take them with you. Though born of me, they will be your brothers. Since you went on saying Ma Rudha to them, they will be famed as seven Maruts and let them be the associates of Vayu and be with him forever. Rama said Vishwamitra, This is the spot where Diti performed her tapas and this is where the seven Maruts were born. Later the city Vishala was built here by Alambhusa, one of the sons of Ikshvaku. His descendants have ruled this country since then. At the present moment, Vishala is being ruled by the king by name Sumati. We will spend the night here in this pleasant city and proceed to Mithila tomorrow. Hearing about the arrival of Vishwamitra and his disciples, Sumati, the king, came to where he was and paid his respects to him. He looked at the young princes and asked Vishwamitra who they were and how it was possible for these young men, evidently princes, to be accompanying the rishis. Vishwamitra told him about the Yaga and how the young sons of Dasharatha had protected the Yaga from getting polluted by the Rakshasas and about how Rama had killed the entire host. 
Sumati was amazed at the thrilling narration and after talking to them for some time, went back to his palace. The rishis spent the night and there, night there, and early in the morning they resumed their walk towards the city Mithila. They reached the outskirts of Mithila and they felt that they were already in Mithila. It was a beautiful city and they all exclaimed, How beautiful! What a lovely city! On the way, Rama discerned a very pleasant looking ashrama. It was isolated, situated in a garden which was almost touching the edge of the city. Rama looked with admiring eyes at the ashrama. He saw that there was no smoke plumbing towards the sky and he realized that there was no one in the ashrama. This was very strange and with wondering eyes, he turned to Vishwamitra and asked him, Yonder, there seems to be an ashrama. I think it is very beautiful, but it seems to me as though it is empty. This beautiful ashrama seems to be uninhabited. How is it possible, my lord? Why is it there is no one in this ashrama situated as it is in such sylvan surroundings? It is empty because of a great man's anger, said Vishwamitra. He continued, I will tell you how it came to pass. This same spot was once like the very heaven itself. It was the ashrama of the great Rishi Gautama. He performed tapas here for many years. Brahma had created a beautiful woman and he called her Ahalya. To Gautama was this Ahalya given in marriage and they lived here for a long time. Once Indra who is famed for his weakness for beautiful women, came to the neighborhood of this ashrama. After making sure that Gautama was away from the hermitage, Indra, assuming the guise of the rishi, entered the apartment where Ahalya was and said, You are a very beautiful woman and my mind is lost in you. I desire you. Ahalya could see that it was not the rishi, though the guise was there. She knew too that it was Indra. She was flattered and pleased that the Lord of the Heavens desired her and she decided to conform to his desire. She agreed to his love making. When it was time for Gautama to return from the river, then Ahalya realized the extent of her sin and also the danger which beset her and Indra. She told him, Go away from here as quickly as you can. I am afraid of the anger of my husband. Please protect yourself from his wrath. Indra laughed and said, Have no fear, I will take good care of myself and of you too. Indra hurried out of the ashram, bent on escaping the eyes of Gautama. He was just late. He saw the rishi entering the ashrama even as he was trying to depart. Gautama had just bathed in the river. He was wearing wet cloths and with his body covered with ashes, he looked like Lord Mahadeva. Gautama was able to know the truth about everything which was happening around him and with the samit and dharba in his hands, he stood still looking at the apparition before him. Indra, assuming the garb of Gautama, it did not take very long for Gautama to guess what had happened. He bent his angry eyes on Indra and said, Your vanity about your being irresistible to women has made you commit this crime. I now curse you. You will lose your manhood. Gautama then entered the ashrama and looked at his wife who was shivering with terror. He said, You will remain here unseen by anyone and you will lie on the ashes and the air will be your food. Years later, when Rama, the powerful son of Dasharatha, enters the ashrama, it will become sanctified and you will regain your form and you will also be cleansed of the sin which you have committed. Gautama left the ashrama and went off to perform tapas while Ahalya is waiting for the touch of your blessed feet to purify her and to sanctify this ashrama. Come, let us enter the hermitage and end the torture of this beautiful woman who is now penitent. Rama, Lakshmana and Vishwamitra entered the ashrama of Gautama and saw the beauty that was Ahalya. Rid as she was of her sin, Ahalya radiated beauty and charm like the moon which has emerged from a screen of clouds. She looked like a sudden flame which leaped out of a cloud of smoke. She was like the sun reflected in a sheet of water. 
Rama and Lakshmana saluted her and flowers rained from the heavens on them. Gautama came there and blessed the princess. The Rishi spent some time together and then they parted. The princess took leave of Gautama and his spouse and with glad hearts the entire group of Rishis walked towards Mithila. Om Shri Ramar Paramastha Chapter 18 of Ramayana's Balakanda Mithila Om Shri Ramaya Ramabhadraya Ramachandraya Vedase Raghunathaya Nathaya Sitaya Pataye Namaha They walked northwards and soon reached the Egnashala of Janaka. Rama was staring with wondering eyes at the elaborate arrangements which had been made for the Yagna. He said, Look, my lord, thousands of well-read Brahmins have now assembled there here and they are all scholars in the Vedas. The ashramas for the Rishis have been constructed and they are so many in number. All the provisions and other materials for the Yagna are there and they look like miniature halls. Tell me, where are we supposed to stay? I am so excited at the sight of all this. Vishwamitra chose a spot which was near the water and which was not too crowded. They were settling down there. Janaka, in the meantime, heard about the arrival of the sage Vishwamitra and he was greatly excited. Accompanied by his preceptor, Sadhananda, he walked fast to where the great man was. He received the sage with great humility. Vishwamitra accepted his homage with graciousness and asked Janaka about the yagna he was performing. After the exchange of formalities, they spent some time together. Janaka was immensely pleased that his yagna was to be blessed by the presence of Vishwamitra. He stood humbly before the rishi and said, All the preparations are being made for the yagna. But before it is performed, I feel that I have found the fruits of the yagna since it is blessed by your gracious presence. I am greatly honoured. All my desires will be granted. I know since you have been pleased to come here in person to bless me. The pundits say that 12 days more are left for the conclusion of the Yagna. I am hopeful that you will be with us all the while and be present when the Devas come to receive their share of the Havis. Janaka prostrated before the sage and accepted the seat indicated by him. Janaka then said, My curiosity has been kindled by the sight of these two young men. They seem to be as valiant as the gods. They walk like young elephants. Their gait is as noble as the gait of lions and as graceful as that of the tiger or wild bulls. Their eyes, my lord, are wide and beautiful like the petals of the lotus. They are carrying bows and arrows along with swords. They are like the Ashwini twins glowing with a handsomeness which is not of this earth. It seems to me as though these two are some gods who have come to the earth by chance. What beautiful eyes! How long! How liquid! Their fingers are protected by guards made of leather as they look as though they are sons of Agni. They are young men who have just entered manhood. Their beauty is such that Even men wish they had been born as women. Such is the charm of these two. It seems to me they have come here to make me happy and my family too. How is it these who seem to be princes used to luxury? How is it that they have walked all this distance? Why have they undertaken this journey and who are these blessed youths? Who is the fortunate king who has them for sons? They are making this entire Yagnashala beautiful with their handsomeness. Like the sun and moon beautify the sky. They seem to be Kshatriyas and since they assemble each other so much, they must be brothers. Tell me who they are. Vishwamitra said, They are the sons of Dasharatha, the king of Kosala. He then recounted to the king about the Yaga at Siddhashrama and the later journey to Mithila. He spoke about the visit to the ashrama of Gautama and he concluded, They heard me talk about the Shiva Dhanus you have with you. I brought them with me so that they can feast 
their eyes on the great bow of Mahadeva, which you have been worshipping for generations. They are archers as you can see and they are naturally eager to see this bow which is famed the world over. When he heard the words of Vishwamitra, Sadananda, the preceptor of Janaka, was greatly excited. He was a rishi rich in tapas which he had performed and he was the son of Gautama. He could not take his eyes off Rama who had granted purity to his mother and he addressed Vishwamitra. My friend, my mother who has been suffering for all these years, many years, had been seen by the princess. She has worshipped them and my noble father has come back to his ashrama. They have been reunited after a very long time. Great indeed is my happiness at the events which have taken place. He then turned to Rama and said, Welcome to you. You are a skion of the Ragu Vamsha and you have come here accompanied by the renowned Rishi Vishwamitra. This man has achieved what cannot even be imagined by ordinary mortals. By the power of his tapas, he has become a Brahmarshi. This great man has assumed the role of guardian to you. You are extremely fortunate in your godfather. He will not talk about himself. So, I will tell you about his magnificent efforts and his achievements. Om Shri Ramar Panamast Chapter 19 of Ramayana's Balakanda Vishwamitra Om Shri Ramaya Ramavadraya Ramachandraya Vedase Raghunathaya Nathaya Sitaya Pataye Nama Pururavas, the ancestor of the lunar race, had six sons, the eldest of whom was Ayu. His descendants were Nahusha, his son Yayati and after Yayati, Puru and the later kings who were more famed as Pauravas. Vijaya was the name of the youngest son of Puru Ravas. Vijaya was the father of a son by name Bhima. Bhima's son was Kanchana and his son was Jahnu, who later swallowed the river Ganga when she rushed in tumult following the king Bagiratha. Jahnu's son was Puru and his son was Balaka. His son was Ajaka. Ajaka had a son by name Kusha, who had four sons, the youngest of whom was Kusha Nabha. Kushanaba. Gadi was the son of Kushanaba. This Vishwamitra is the son of Gadi. He was known in those days as Kaushika and he was a famous king. He ruled his subjects well and he was reputed to be a very good king. Om Shri Ramar Panamast Chapter 20 of Ramayana's Balakanda Vashishta hosts the king Om Ramaya Ramabhadraya Ramachandraya Vedase Raghunathaya Nathaya Sritaya Pataye Namaha Once the king had gone to the forest with a large army. He was visiting several places. He visited cities which were ruled by him and in the course of his journey, he saw many beautiful rivers, hills and ashramas nestling at their sides. One such ashrama was that of Vashishta, the son of Brahma. From a distance, Kaushika could see the flowering trees and shrubs and he could see the orchards and there was a small stream flowing slowly past the ashrama. Several deer and other tame animals could be seen and he was very surprised to see Siddhas and Charanas as well as Gandharvas and Kinnaras. The place was resounding with the music made by the birds which had nests on the trees and there was peace reigning in the ashrama and in the forest which surrounded the ashrama. On going nearer, the king saw several rishis performing tapas and there were many who were bent on meditation and who seemed to be lost to the world. It seemed to him that Brahmaloka of whom he had heard was not in the heavens but here on the earth where 
Vashishta was. It is a rule among Kshatriyas that they should not pass the ashrama of a Rishi without paying respect to him and in return the Rishi has to welcome him and honor him since a king is said to be Narayana himself. Kaushika entered the ashrama of Vashishta and prostrated before the great man. The Rishi was very pleased with him and welcomed him with great excitement. He sent for a seat noble enough to befit a king and he made the king sit on it. He offered fruits and water. Kaushika received all this with a humility, becoming of a great king and they spoke to each other about general things. Vashishda asked the conventional question which should be asked. He said, I hope your subjects are happy under your rule which is sure to be righteous. I hope your servants are well behaved and obedient. All your enemies are subdued. Is your army large and powerful? Is your treasury full? Are your children well and happy and obedient? Kaushika answered them all in the affirmative. Each had great respect for the other and they spent a long time talking about many things. After a long time had passed, Vashishta said, I want you to accept my hospitality. It is a rare and great honor that you have visited our ashrama with your army. I want to entertain you. You are a righteous king and a good man. I am pleased with you. You are to be honored and give me the pleasure of doing so. Kaushika was touched by the words of the Rishi and spoke very humbly and said, Your words full of affection have done more than a feast can do. You have already given us fruits and milk. The sight of you has made us pure for birth after birth. What need is there for a feast? You are the person who should be honored as God and it is not right that you should say I deserve to be honored. I will soon be taking leave of you to continue my journey. Kaushika felt that it would only embarrass the Rishi to feed so many of them and to save him this he rose up very tactfully as if to go. Vashishta would have none of it. Again and again he insisted that the king with his retinue should stay and accept his hospitality. Finally, Kaushika had to accede to his request and said, So be it, my lord. You are so eager to play host to us and I have not a chance to escape from your goodness. Laughing together, they walked out of the ashrama. Vashishta called out, Surabi, child, Shabale, come here. Kaushika was wondering whom he was calling and even as he was thinking about it, a beautiful cow came and stood before Vashishta and said, You call me father? Kaushika saw that the cow was unbelievably beautiful. She was of a lovely shape and her hide was mottled black and white. Her eyes were soft and gentle and Vashishta said, Shabale, this is the king of the country and his name is Kaushika. He has come with his army and I wish to entertain him and his retinue. Prepare for them a feast with all the things necessary. Let there be nothing wanting and I want them all to go back satisfied. Hurry and create everything. Shabala was Kamadhenu, the divine cow which rose up out of the milk ocean when the devas and asuras churned it for Amrita. She had been given to Vashishta. She created a feast for the royal guest and his attendants. There were all kinds of food and drinks of every type imaginable. The food was such that it suited every palate. There were heaps and heaps of all the edibles they could think of and the guests were served with affection and care so that everyone had his fill of food and was satisfied. Kaushika was extremely happy and he saluted the Rishi with his men. He then said, My Lord, never in my life have I been so entertained and never have I tasted food like what I ate today. I want to ask a favor of you. I was greatly impressed by the power of Shabala, your cow. A cow such as she should be in the possession of the king of the country. Bounty like hers should benefit everyone. Please give her to me and in return I will give you a hundred thousand cows. 
This cow is a jewel and any precious jewel rightfully belongs to the king. Please give her to me. Vashishta was taken aback at the words of Kaushika. But he composed himself and softly said, I hate to refuse anyone anything, but Shavala is someone different. Not even in exchange for a hundred thousand cows will I give my Shurabi. You may say that you will give me heaps and heaps of silver and gold, but it will be of no use. I will not part with Shabala and that is Sart. Kaushika stood as though stunned. Vashishta's eyes were now wet and he said, O king, Shabala is part of me and I cannot be separated from her. It is like trying to part the fame from a man who is famous. All my religious rites are performed because of the gifts of Shabala. I cannot give her to you. <coughs> Kaushika would not give up. He said, I will give you a thousand elephants fully caprisoned in gold and silver. I will give you eight hundred horses and chariots. I will give you more if you so desire. I will give you a crore of Kapila cows. Please give, give this one cow Shabala to me. If you are so desirous, I will give you gold and precious stones without number. Vashishta shook his head sadly but firmly and said, No, she is my jewel and she is my wealth. She is my everything and she is my very life. My tapas is all comprised in her. What is the use of dilating on the subject? I will never part with her and it is futile on your part to offer me wealth. I have no use for any of the things you mention. I have Shabala and she will be with me forever and ever. Om Shri Ramar Panamastha